even when we do not know how to pray. Send your spirit to comfort us in our need and loss, and help us to commend Carmen, Brian, and Laura to your merciful care. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This time I'd like to invite Sylvia forward for a moment for mission. You may all enjoy her headgear. <laughs> While she does that, I'm going to get new batteries for my mic. <laughs> Good morning. I'm your friendly elf today. Wow, we have a lot of great things in our boxes already. And I think somebody brought face masks, which is a really good idea. But here's the list. And as you all know, it's going to Pete's Place and the gentlemen that meet at the park. So it's really important that, just think about it, they're probably very excited to get socks. So it's just really important. This is our one and only Christmas drive, and I'm just really excited about how full the boxes already are. Keep it up, everybody. And if for some reason you just don't want to do the shopping, Find a friendly elf, and we will take your donation and shop for you. Thank you. Do I have to tell some jokes till Madeline gets back? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Almost perfect timing. Liz, I think we've got a couple of uh, good morning, everybody. Hi. Oh. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, we have um, signed up liturgists all the way through December, except for one date, and that's December 19th. So if any of you would like to come forward, I'll okay. sign you up. Okay, okay there's already... Going, going, gone. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Sylvia. Also, um, I have a sign-up sheet. Of course, it's on my kitchen table for greeters. Uh, Jackie has been, you know, there holding down the fort for I don't know how long. And if we can help a little bit, that would be wonderful. So. Uh, if I would have somebody for next Sunday, I think Jenny, you said you would, and then I promise you I'll have the sign-up sheet here. Mm -hmm. um, that would be greeters and also uh, contact tracing forms to help Jackie out a little bit here. Thanks, Jackie, for all you've been doing. Thank you, Liz for all that you do to make sure worship happens every Sunday morning. Oh, Additionally, we have a few Advent bags ready for pickup. I know that next week is a holiday weekend. It is also the first Sunday of Advent, but some of you may be traveling following the Thanksgiving holiday. Is my mic working? No. Awesome. <laughs> We'll try that again. Where was I? Advent bags. Next week is a holiday weekend. I know that some of you may be traveling and not able to be with us on the first Sunday of Advent, which is November 28th. And so Liz and the worship committee have prepared a very few Advent bags for the devotionals that are sitting on the table. You'll be able to collect them on your way out. If you will be here next Sunday, we will have Plenty more bags then available for you to pick up. The Advent devotional bags contain a devotional booklet that has daily devotions for the four weeks of Advent and through Epiphany. It also has five um, LED tea lights and a little sprig of greenery so that you can have an Advent wreath and an Advent candle lighting practice at home that will be safe and won't light anything on fire. 
If you are interested in having an Advent gift bag and you would like to receive um, a virtual devotional rather than a hard copy print, there are sign-up sheets at the, on the table as well. Please fill one of those out so that we can get that sent to you. I think that's all of our announcements. Yes? Okay. As you all have heard me say before, and will hear me say again for some time, Westminster Session continues to be committed to following our COVID-19 safe protocols for worship. As Christians, we are called to help care for the most vulnerable among us. While masks and social distancing certainly help spread the slow of COVID, we know that it is vaccines which do the heavy lifting. If you have not already received a vaccine, we encourage you to do so. If you are unvaccinated, we strongly encourage you to worship with us online. Beginning next week, we will be doing Zoom worship during Advent. You can worship as we are worshiping here in the sanctuary. If you are fully vaccinated, we also encourage you to get a booster that have been opened to all residents of New Mexico over the age of 18 who fulfilled the timeline requirements for when they received their first full dose of vaccination. If you missed them on your way in, there are contact tracing forms on the podium by the back door. Please fill one out so that if we need to, we can get a hold of you. All these protocols are here to help keep us and our communities safe. We ask that you do abide by them. If for any reason you feel that you cannot, or you do not feel safe and comfortable worshiping in person, you are more than welcome to join us online. We know that God worships with us no matter where we go or where we are when we sing God's praises, or say them, since we're not singing just yet. Durante este tiempo de COVID, seguimos siendo la iglesia adorando a Dios juntos, aunque no estemos juntos. En Dios somos una iglesia más grande de lo que cualquier edificio puede contener. Gracias a Dios. During this time of COVID, we continue to be the church, worshiping God together, even though we are not all together in one space. In God, we are made one church bigger than any building might contain. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise for the call to worship if you are able. You'll find it printed in your bulletin. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Christ will reign forever and ever. God has established the world. Christ has come among us. God will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Christ will amend the old ways, bringing justice and peace. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God. Christ will reign forever and ever. Let us worship God. You may be seated.
si decimos que no tenemos pecado, nos engañamos a nosotros mismos y la verdad no está en nosotros. Si confesamos nuestros pecados, Dios es justo para perdonar nuestros pecados y limpiarnos de todo maldad. Beloved, we are made in the divine image, and God called us good. Yet we go our own way, causing harm to ourselves, to one another, and to the planet. Confident in the mercy of the one who made us and saved us, let us confess our sin to God and to one another. I invite you to join with me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. God, our Creator, you made the earth and scattered the stars. You filled sea, sky, and land with creatures great and small. You gave us a creation full of wonders, yet we abuse the planet that sustains our life. We have wasted water, polluted the air, and exploited your good earth. Forgive us, O oh God. Restore in us respect for this world you have made, and make us worthy stewards of his gifts and glories, for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom all things are in you. Amen. Cualquiera que está en Cristo, nueva criatura es. El pasado ha quedado atrás. Todo vuelve a ser puro y nuevo. Amigas y amigos, creen en las buenas nuevas del Evangelio. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Now in Espanol. 
La lectura bíblica se encuentra en Juan capítulo 18, versículos del 33 al 37. Pilatos volvió a entrar en el palacio, llamó a Jesús y le preguntó, ¿Eres tú el rey de los judíos? Jesús le dijo, eso lo preguntas tú por tu cuenta o porque otros te lo han dicho de mí le contestó Pilato ¿acaso yo soy judío? los de tu nación y los jefes de los sacerdotes son los que te han entregado a mí ¿qué has hecho? Jesús le contestó mi reino no es de este mundo si lo fuera Tendría gente a mi servicio que pelearía para que yo no fuera entregado a los judíos. Pero mi reino no es de aquí. Le preguntó entonces Pilato, ¿Así que tú eres rey? Jesús le contestó, Tú lo has dicho, soy rey. Yo nací y vine al mundo para decir lo que es la verdad. Y todos los que pertenecen a la verdad me escuchan. Esto es la palabra de Dios. No. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, who is rock and redeemer. Amen. Did you know that today is the last Sunday in the liturgical calendar year? We have made it through an entire liturgical and regular calendar year together. I am so glad to be here serving among you this year with all of its COVID ups and downs has been a challenge for all of us. Yet for me, it has mostly and primarily been a joy, a joy to meet you all, however slowly, a joy to plan worship with all our musicians, a joy to care for you in times of sorrow and distress, a joy to join you on your individual faith journeys and on the journey of this whole congregation together. Thank you for so welcoming me. So yes, this is the last Sunday of the liturgical calendar. Last week, we finished up the Sundays after Pentecost, where we spent, what was it, five months in the Book of Mark, it felt like? Yeah. And today we close out ordinary time. The Sundays between our two primary festival seasons, Easter Tide and Christmas Tide. Today, with my white stole, we celebrate Christ the King Sunday, the last hurrah before we step into the new year, into the quiet waiting of Advent. But what do we do with Christ the King Sunday? or with our scripture lesson, which deposits us unceremoniously and with no context into Jesus's first interview with Pilate. As one of the Bible study participants noted, thank you, Cindy, it seems like the passage should include one more verse, verse 38, the one where Pilate asks, what is truth? And it also seems strange to step into and then out of, again, this story of Jesus' unjust trial, which leads directly to the cross. As I have sat with this story this week, I am coming to appreciate the way this text juxtaposes with both the Advent story and with the name of this Sunday. Jesus doesn't claim the title king here, but he doesn't precisely reject it either. Instead, he says, my kingdom is not from this world. And we know that Jesus rejected the notions of kingship his followers and the people of Jerusalem wanted him to take up. Yet we say, when we say Christ the king, 
Do we not imagine the triumphal entry? We thrust all those notions of kingship that Jesus has rejected right back on him. And all of this carried into Advent when we remember the Christ child, born in a stable, to parents from a town that is but a shadow of its glory days in the reign of King David. Christ the King Sunday, when we recognize both Christ's power and his rejection of the traditional forms of it. After all, no self-respecting king would allow himself to die nailed to a cross. Most kings are deeply concerned with maintaining and growing power. Jesus washes the dusty, tired feet of his followers. History tells us that many princes, dukes, generals, random people on the street were so eager to gain power that they killed the king and any other claimants to the throne so that they could rule uncontested. Earlier in the Gospel of John in chapter 6, when Jesus realizes the crowd is going to seize him and make him king, he heads off into the mountains alone to avoid it. Yet we sing, crown him with many crowns. Jesus is a paradox. And so Christ the King Sunday is as well. And so I've been sitting with Cindy's comment about verse 38 being left out since Wednesday, turning it over in my head. Why is that verse missing? Now, not being in the head of the group that sets the revised common lectionary texts, I don't actually have an answer for us that speaks to what they were thinking. But I do have an answer. If we include Pilate's question, what is truth? We inevitably get very bogged down with it because it's a very good question with many implications and possibilities. It is a question that Christian scholars have been debating almost since the moment it was asked. But if we exclude that verse, as the Revised Common Lectionary does, it is these words that stand out. My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. A brief aside, the Gospel of John was written at the end of the first century, possibly in the very first years of the second. It's written in very good Greek and it contains sophisticated theology. It was clearly written for a diverse audience, Gentiles and Jews, or perhaps a primarily Jewish audience who lived in the diaspora, not in the Roman province of Judea. And while the author of John quotes the Hebrew scriptures readily, his exact quotations do not appear in any known Jewish texts. Most importantly, the author is clearly differentiating himself and the tradition he represents from the majority of Jewish culture and religion out of which this tradition that he represents arose. We know that by the end of the first century there were already Christian persecutions by the Roman Empire. It seems likely that tensions between the more or less tolerated Jewish religious populations and the not really at all tolerated Christian religious populations would have arisen as everyone tried to escape too much notice by the empire. These tensions, this desire by the author of John to be seen as distinct from Jewishness, means that John as a gospel talks a lot about the Jews. And this language has led to Christian persecutions of Jewish peoples across history, 
including the Christian Church's tacit approval of Hitler's anti-Jewish policies. To be very, very clear, Jesus was a Jewish man, and he would not have differentiated himself from his religion in this way. This way of speaking about Judaism is a later insertion by the author of John that it has led to horrific acts in the name of Christ, persecution, oppression, slaughter, and running through it all, a refusal to pay any attention to those acts, and a refusal to acknowledge the humanity and sacred worth of Jewish people, or Muslim people, or Buddhist people, but in this particular case from the Gospel of John, Jewish people. These are the acts of empire, of people clinging to power and climbing over others in pursuit of more power, and all too often, this is what kingship looks like in the world. Men with power pursuing more of it, an innocence and a vulnerable, crushed without a care. Yet we claim Christ as our king, and we know that he utterly rejects that paradigm. Because his kingdom is not from this world. Often we believe that means Christ's kingdom is elsewhere on another plane. It's nice to imagine, right, that someday we'll go someplace where there is neither sorrow nor sighing, where the wolf lies down with the lamb, where pain is banished and all are made whole. The problem with that vision is that it's a dream, and it's a dream that quite neatly absolves us of the very real problems that plague us. And that seems very unlike Jesus, as we have seen him in Mark. Jesus, who wants us to understand that what he asks is both simple and the hardest thing we will ever do. No, I think what Jesus is saying here is that his kingship is utterly unlike any other worldly kingship. That unlike Caesar, his justice is just, and their vulnerable are cared for. This is why Ana Maria Isasidias coined the phrase kin dumb, because we don't have a word in English, or in Greek, or in Hebrew, or in Spanish that captures what it is Jesus is doing. Our language fails us. We call him king despite knowing that he is doing a new thing, calling us to new ways of being, to community bound by mutual relationships and not hierarchies, a rejection of the hierarchical relationships that are often implied by language we use in worship, kingdom, realm, reign, king, understanding them to be contrary to what Jesus was describing. We could even backtrack kingdom to come up with kin as a replacement for king, because isn't that what the incarnation is all about? The Word became flesh and lived among us, God in human form. What was that song from the mid-90s? What if God was one of us, just a stranger on the bus, trying to make his way home? God in Jesus is one of us, kin to us, calling us to a new way of being. And usually, we think of this way of being as pretty solely about other people, which seems a narrow view of God's desire for abundant life, if you ask me. God's creation, after all, is not just humankind, but all that is around us, the earth and the moon, the seas and the rivers, the yucca and the pinyon, coyotes and ground squirrels and lizards and ants and ravens, and yes, even those gosh darn skunks. <laughs> Cornfields, too, and cattle and sheep, dry desert dust and rich prairie soil, all of this God created and called good and gave it to us to be its stewards. And we do not have to look far 
to see how that has gone. Just as we have oppressed other humans throughout history, we have also exploited and despoiled God's good creation. And because power likes to accumulate more power, stopping human-created climate change has seemed impossible. We cannot get governments to agree. We cannot get corporations to agree. And all the while, climate change keeps rolling on, causing harm to the most vulnerable, whether they be human, vegetable, or mineral. Yet, we still proclaim Christ is king, understanding that he is a new kind of king, one who will not stand for the casual exploitation of anyone or anything. And so today, we will dedicate our new solar panels. They're right above us now, rows of solar panels lining up before our bell. They pull electricity for our building from the sun, that renewable, at least for the next few billion years, resource. As a church, we decrease our reliance on fossil fuels, and with all of that, we remember that we, too, are part of God's creation. That we are kin not only with each other, but with all that God has created. And we are called to be in mutual, healthy relationship with each other, with creation. This is what it means to celebrate Christ as king, Christ as kin. May it be so. Amen.
hear these words of scripture. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God sent them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good, God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth. Of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind. And the cattle of every kind. And everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. And all of this was given into our care by God when we were created. And we have used this bounty ill. So today we bless and dedicate our solar panels, recommitting ourselves to the stewardship of God's creation in both word and deed. We give thanks to God for the gift of sunlight so plentiful here in New Mexico which now powers the electricity of our church. We give thanks for the work of the Creation Care Committee, reminding us that God's kingdom is not restricted to humankind. So let us pray. God, who is creator and sustainer, bless these solar panels. Let the sun shine fully on them. Bless those who built them, who installed them, who inspected them, who turned them on. Bless the people of this congregation who worked hard to bring them to our roof. Help us to remember that all we have comes from you and remind us to treat it well. All these things we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Creation Care Committee has prepared little packets of seeds for all of us. You can find them here in the front at the end of worship. They are to remind you of God's creation, that we are called to nurture it, to water it, to watch it grow, and to rejoice in the beauty that it brings. Just one clarification, they are seeds. You cannot eat them. <laughs> the birds can eat them. You can eat them if you wash them and toast them, okay? <laughs> and I'd like to invite our stewardship chairs forward to prepare the offering. I used to be that tall. <laughs> 
first of all, thank you very much for those of you who sent in pledges and who gave pledges last week. And thank you also to the people that we know have sent in pledges that were received this past week and that we will receive today. Our stewardship campaign is off and running. We haven't met that budget yet, so if you haven't yet um, decided on your pledge, if you could do that within the next couple of uh, weeks, we would greatly appreciate that. But it goes to remind me from something that Madeline said last week about talking about the fireweed that grows abundantly after a drought. It's abundant on the ski mountain right now, and we challenge you to be fireweed. We already are on well on our way to doing that with our new solar panels and landscaping with um, drought resistant plants around our building. And along with today's sermon, if, if we are, even though Jesus' kingdom isn't of this world, it becomes part of the world when we apply the, our actions using the resources that we have been given. So with your resources, we are able to do wonderful things. Put solar panels on our roof and give to back to this community. There are wonderful plans in place coming up. Um, I am really excited personally about a new Afghan family that this congregation will be um, helping to take care of and get situated. And we can do those kinds of major projects because of what you have provided in your pledges. So thank you for your continued support of Westminster. So if you're offering, watching online, I invite you to gather your offering and prepare it to be delivered to the church. We did provide you with an envelope for your pledge. You can That's already stamped and addressed. And you'll just have to put it in the post box. For those of you who are here in the sanctuary, I invite you to leave your offering in the communion table, on the plate on the communion table as you leave this space when you also get your seeds. And if you have anything for our elves, you can leave that at the table as well. We have a table full of bounty. And so we give thanks to God. God, you are our creator and giver of life and all things. We thank you for your generous blessings on us and ask that you take our lives and offerings and transform them so that we too may be a blessing for the world. Amen. I invite you not to pray the prayers of the people. When I say, hear us, O God, I invite you to respond. Your mercy is great. Let's try that one time. Hear us, O God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. Is great. <laughs> Living in the light of Christ, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all God's creation, saying, hear us, O God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. God of new life, you renew us daily through your baptismal promises. Guide us in all we do that your power may shine in our words and deeds. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the earth, for the health of all bodies of water, for the Santa Fe River watershed and the Rio Grande, and for all rivers and streams that in the clear, clean waters you have created for us to drink and use, we may see your love for all creatures. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. For all who live by the bounty of the earth, for those who sow seeds, raise livestock, and catch fish, for people who work in processing plants and factories or manufacture farm implements, for people who pack and haul and sell vegetables, fruits, and meats. Bless them in their labor for the sake of all who depend on them for food. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. For all governments, for President Joe Biden and Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, for city councils, for county commissioners, 
for mayors, and for all who vote. Give wisdom to our people that we will choose leaders who will serve the needs of everyone and everything in your creation. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. For children throughout the world, for good schools and compassionate teachers, for healthy homes, for clothing, food, and shelter enough that they can thrive and grow, for friends and neighbors, aunts and uncles, grandparents and parents who watch well over little ones, that their joy in this world be complete. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. For all people who are in distress, those who are hurting, those who worry, those who are sick, those in need of a friend, for all on our prayer list, for those whose names are known only to you. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Hear now the concerns of this body spoken in the silence of our own hearts. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We re remember with gratitude for their witness the saints we remember in this coming week, especially Carmen, Brian, and Laura. Help us honor their faith with our lives. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom and which we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, Padre nuestro, que estás en los cielos, santificado sea tu nombre, venga tu reino, haga se tu voluntad, como en los cielos, si también en la tierra. El pan nuestro de cada día, danos su obra. Y perdonamos nuestros pecados, como también perdonamos a nuestros deudores. Y no nos deje caer en tentación, mas líbranos del mal, porque tu Dios es el reino, el poder y la gloria por todos los siglos. Amén. We are all part of God's kingdom, from the smallest bacteria to the tallest mountain, each of us valued and honored and loved. 
So go into the world and treat the creation as you yourselves would like to be treated. Take care of it. Honor it. Remember that God created it and called it good. And may the blessing of the holy triune God, who was and is and is to come, first and last, beginning and end, Alpha and Omega, be and abide with you this day and forevermore. Amen. I invite you to remain seated for the postlude.